Hello, Fairfax County Public Schools. I'm Dr. Brabrand, Superintendent. Thank you for joining us this evening for our second Town Hall of 2021. Tonight, we're going to be talking all about vaccines and our vaccination rollout here in Virginia and in Fairfax County Public Schools. We are delighted to have a lot of special guests here, which I'll be introducing shortly, and thank you for tuning in. Today, the governor also shared more information about his goal to vaccinate Virginia. We're working hard to reach herd immunity and get almost 50,000 Virginians a day vaccinated. We also in Fairfax County Public Schools have began in partnership with ANOVA to register and vaccinate all of FCPS staff as we prepare for return to school for in-person learning. We're working very closely with ANOVA and we have begun the registration process. I do want to share with you and acknowledge that some of you did experience some frustrations today as we began that process. And as the governor said today, we must all work together. This has never been done before. There are going to be some bumps along the way, and we ask for your patience as we all work toward the goal of vaccinating Virginia. I do want to read a few uh, comments from ANOVA for the first day of vaccine registration for Fairfax County teachers and staff. ANOVA did expand its scheduling capacity to uh, allow for more open time slots for teachers and staff. And in response to the overwhelming volume of traffic today, it is working to increase its server capacity for scheduling uh, future appointments. Uh, as a, a reminder, FCPS has established scheduling tiers for specific staff to manage the flow of 24,000 plus people who are seeking appointments. We want everybody to be vaccinated, but as we shared before, we do need you to follow the, priorita the prioritization schedule that we shared with you in our earlier messaging. ANOVA did realize, though, with the added capacity that it wasn't quite enough to handle the demand today. Again, they've worked throughout the day to add additional capacity. It's important to know that ANOVA has been a great partner here in Fairfax County. They have already administered more than 35,000 doses of the vaccine in the past month. Focus first on our phase 1A healthcare providers who really are on the front lines of this pandemic. It has been a one of opportunity to continue to partner with them. And now as they move away from 1A workers, we are working now in phase 1B as they work on educators. And again, we are delighted that ANOVA will be working to get all of FCPS uh, vaccinated over the next three weeks. We'll continue to keep you updated with the latest information from ANOVA as they go through the registration process. And ANOVA shares that they know that it's frustrating to have glitches on the very first day with all the excitement and hope in our community. But the good news is the vaccine is now available for our FCPS community. We have a trusted partner in ANOVA with a record who has a record of safety and efficiency for delivering vaccine to our workforce and many workforces here in the Fairfax County region. We're gonna to continue to work together with them to make sure the vaccine can be received and scheduled for all of our FCPS employees. Uh, they shared that they appreciate uh, your patience. We appreciate your patience and we'll continue to keep you informed all the way through this vaccination process. Again, these vaccines represent a game changer in this pandemic. We're very excited to continue to work on our return to school for in-person learning. And we know that vaccines are only a part of the story. School mitigation strategies following those key safety strategies in schools are equally as important, if not more important, to continue to make sure that we limit the impact of COVID-19 transmission in our schools. But tonight we're gonna to talk about vaccines and the immunization process. And I have a lot of special guests that I wanna introduce now. First of all, we have Dr. Benjamin Short Schwartz, the Director of the Division of Population Health and uh, Epidemiology in the Fairfax County Health Department. Uh, we also have Dr. Lisa Williams, our new Chief Equity Officer, uh, who just joined us a few weeks ago and we're so delighted to have her now in this role here in Fairfax County Public Schools. And I'm gonna ask him to step right up to the microphone right now, Sean McDonald, our Interim Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. So all of them will be here tonight to talk with you and answer some of your questions around vaccines and the immunization process. 
But we're going to start with Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz, first of all, welcome. We know you have a long history of expertise here in Fairfax County Public Schools. You also have previous experience at the CDC uh, and in Los Angeles with their Department of Health. So we're just honored that someone of your magnitude would be here tonight to talk to the community about the COVID-19 vaccines and vaccination. Thank you very much, Dr. Brabrand. And uh, thank you to all of the FCPS staff for all of the work that you do for the children in our community. What I'd like to do for the next uh, 10 or so minutes is to share some information so that people can better understand COVID-19 vaccines, how they work, what the studies have showed about their safety and effectiveness in order for people to make the best decisions about vaccination for themselves, their families, and their community. We've all heard a lot of information throughout the pandemic and it's not surprising if we look at the numbers that we see a very large number of cases and deaths both here in Fairfax County as well as around the country. There have been over 50,000 cases identified here with more than 500 new cases each day, more than 3,000 people hospitalized and unfortunately over 700 deaths. Nationally, we have exceeded 22 million cases and over 373,000 deaths. In our county, we've been experiencing a surge in infection since mid-October, and there are several reasons why cases have been increasing. With the colder weather, people are spending more time indoors, families have gotten together over the holidays, increased travel, increased attendance at restaurants, gyms, and other locations, and all of this might be put down under the uh, heading of mitigation fatigue. As people get tired of being in their houses and away from others, unfortunately, the virus is more likely to spread. But even now, as disease is increasing, we do know how to end the pandemic. And there are really two ways to get the immunity that our community needs in order for the pandemic to end. One way is by getting the disease, and the other way is by getting vaccinated. So if vaccination leading to immunity is going to be our pathway out of the pandemic, then it's important that we understand enough about vaccines and vaccination so people can make the right decisions for themselves. Um, for some people, it may be difficult to do this, in part because you may not have enough information or you may be seeing contradictory or concerning information on the internet but for others, it might be difficult because of a lack of trust in government or because of historical experiences such as medical experiments that have been done on members of the African-American community and the ongoing harms of racism. So it's really understandable the vaccine hesitancy that may exist among some people. So let me talk a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccines. In December, two mRNA vaccines, one from Pfizer and the other from Moderna, were approved by the FDA and recommended by CDC. Each of these vaccines, before it was authorized, was studied in over 30,000 volunteers, including adults of all ages, women and men, and people of different races and ethnicities. Following the conclusion of these studies, independent scientists reviewed all of the study data before FDA then authorized those vaccines to be used. And this process was the same as they are used for other vaccines and no corners were cut in this process. This next slide shows how mRNA vaccines work. The vaccine includes messenger RNA or mRNA, which is genetic material that provides instructions on making the coronavirus spike protein which is found on the surface of the virus. This mRNA is packaged in a lipid particle, and once the vaccine is injected into our bodies, the particles deliver the instructions to our cells. Inside our cells, the mRNA instructions cause the cell to produce the spike protein, which is delayed on, displayed on the surface of the cell and stimulates our body to produce an immune response making antibodies to protect us from infection. Next slide. 
So thinking about how these mRNA vaccines work, there are several important facts to understand. And first, and importantly, you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccine because there is no live virus in the vaccine, only the instructions for this one protein. Secondly, the mRNA does not interact with our DNA in any way because the mRNA never enters the nucleus of the cell where our DNA is kept, so that there is no need for concern about possible mutations. Third, the cell breaks down and gets rid of the mRNA after it has finished using the instructions so that there is no long-term impact on our bodies. And fourth, these do not contain a tracking microchip. There's been this rumor that's been flying around on the internet, but clearly if the government wanted to keep track of us, there would be better ways than doing so through the vaccine. So one concern that a number of people have expressed is around the speed of vaccine development, asking how can these vaccines have been made so quickly when other vaccines take years to make? The response to this concern is that the mRNA vaccine technology actually has been studied for more than a decade before the pandemic. So that once the pandemic occurred, this technology was available to be used for the virus that causes COVID-19. In addition, the government has spent billions of dollars providing funding to the companies so they don't have to put their own money at risk to more efficiently um, develop the manufacturing processes at the same time that these clinical studies were being done. So as soon as the results were available, there was vaccine ready to be shipped. Again, it's important to emphasize that no corners were cut in evaluating or approving the vaccines and the types of studies, their size, as well as the independent scientific review. So let's look a little bit at the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine trials. The Pfizer trial included over 43,000 participants and Moderna 30,000. Each of them had efficacy in the mid 90% range. And in both trials, almost all of the cases of severe infection occurred in the placebo group. And what this means is that while there were several people in the vaccine group who did develop COVID disease, that in general, this disease was much less severe, indicating that the vaccine not only prevents infection, but also if you do get infected, that infection is going to be more mild. In addition, the vaccine was efficacious in all age, gender, and racial and ethnic groups, and no serious safety concerns with, were found with um, some local reactions that were more common with the second dose. So while vaccination is overall safe and effective, people often want to know more specifically, will the vaccine work in people like me? So I'd like to share the data from the vaccination trial and share with you how well the vaccine works in different segments of the population. And so shown here are the data for the Pfizer clinical trial, and you will be receiving the Pfizer vaccine from ANOVA. So overall, more than 18,000 people were vaccinated and the vaccine efficacy was 95% you can see that it was equally effective in those who were 18 to 64 years old, as well as those who were 65 years old and older. And I'll point out here that the vaccine has not yet been tested in younger individuals, and so um, those studies are still being done and the vaccine is not yet recommended for children. In addition, the performance of the vaccine was similar among all racial and ethnic groups. And while if you look at the uh, percent estimate for efficacy among the Asian population, it looks lower, but it is not statistically different from the other population groups. And in fact, there was only one, Asia, one uh, COVID case in an Asian vaccine rep, uh, recipient. For underlying medical conditions, the vaccine also was equally effective in those who had a high risk condition, 
heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, or obesity, as to people who did not have a high-risk condition. I'd like to just ask uh, Dr. Williams if you'd like to share anything with us about um, the vaccine in different racial and ethnic groups. Yeah, um, and thank you for the question. I think it's really important to start the conversation as we did here, right? Acknowledging that there is a history, a history that we should recognize that people in bodies like mine have trepidations, have concerns, and physicians should not be afraid of leaning into those conversations, speaking to people in a way that is accessible, allaying those fears, because we know that this pandemic is disproportionately impacting those groups. And so I think the big take home is that we should not be afraid to ask the questions. And in return, others should not be afraid of leaning into those conversations that might be difficult, but historically, there are reasons that people might have those concerns. So thank you for the question. Thank, thank you. Um, so regarding vaccine safety among these different groups, although the publicly available FDA briefing document did not share the actual numbers, it states that there were no specific safety concerns identified in subgroup analysis by race, age, or age race and ethnicity, or medical condition or prior COVID-19 vaccination. So just like effectiveness, there were no differences in safety between these populations. So finally, I'd like to share a bit more of information about vaccine safety, because among the many people who say they're interested in more, more information about vaccine before making a decision to get vaccinated, usually safety is their biggest concern. So here's what we know and what we don't know about COVID-19 vaccine safety. We know that many people who receive the vaccine have pain at the site of injection, and some had symptoms like chills, headaches, muscle aches, or tiredness that lasts for one or two days. These are um, the body's normal reaction to the vaccine, and um, again, they only last for a short period of time. Uh, and these side effects may be found more commonly with the second than with the first dose. We also know that rarely people have had a serious allergic reaction to vaccination, and that reaction is called anaphylaxis. These have occurred in a little more than one out of every 100,000 people who are vaccinated. Among 21 people with anaphylaxis who were studied by CDC, they had follow-up data on 20 of them, and all of them recovered from their reaction. There are also some people who have had less severe allergic reactions to the vaccine. People who have had allergic reactions in the past to the COVID-19 vaccine or any of its ingredients should not get the vaccine. But people who have had other allergies can get the vaccine. But if they've had a severe reaction, or a severe reaction to any injected vaccine, they should wait after being vaccinated for 30 minutes rather than 15 minutes just to make sure they are safe. In addition, where the vaccine is administered, the medical staff will have epinephrine available uh, if needed to treat an allergic reaction. There are no other serious side effects that have been found that are known to be caused by the vaccine, and as more people are getting vaccinated, CDC is collecting information on whether there are other side effects that may occur and will provide updates as we learn more. So far, over 10 million people in the United States have been vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccines. And again, CDC is looking to see if there's any evidence of other side effects occurring. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, for this very informative presentation, and thank you for leading with data. That is one of the things we've been talking about as we make decisions around return to school uh, for in-person learning is being data-driven in our decision-making. And thank you also, Dr. Schwartz, for sharing the data by ethnicity. This is one of the things that we are talking about in Fairfax County Public Schools, to put equity at the center of all that we say and do, and sharing that data helps set the conversation that Dr. Williams, you shared about making sure that all of our employees, and we have a diverse workforce as they prepare to get vaccinated, 
understand the impact for how it affects them and that they have the comfort to be able to ask the questions and as Dr. Williams said, that our physicians and our medical staff have the comfort to respond with the answers that people need to feel comfortable about moving forward with getting a vaccination. Let's take a few calls right now. Uh, callers, welcome to the town hall on vaccine and vaccinations. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I have two, I have two quick questions. Um, my first is, is Inova um, organized and plan to guarantee that we will all receive the second dose of the vaccine? I know we've seen in other countries because of poor planning, people get the first dose, but then they run out of enough for people to get the second dose. So thank you for that question. ANOVA has assured us that vaccine supply is not a problem at all. And the scheduling for your second dose will take place at your first dose appointment. ANOVA, not Fairfax County Public Schools, will be handling the scheduling around your second dose. But they've assured us that the pipeline of vaccines is not a problem. They're expecting to have additional uh, slots for our folks in the weeks ahead. Uh, and so we're feeling very good about that. And that second appointment for your second dose will be scheduled by ANOVA at the time of your first, um, your first appointment. So thank you for that question. Uh, caller, welcome to the vaccine and vaccination town hall. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I had a question about the um, schedule that was emailed out to teachers and staff. Um, in regard to um, scheduling our um, appointments to get our first dose of the vaccine. And, um, I, you know, I noticed we're in a kind of a phased approach, like uh, like you had planned for the in-person learning phased-in approach. Um, but I, I'm worried because um, so far, you know, staff are being asked to follow this the schedule, but we don't have any assurance from FCPS that um, in-person learning will be delayed a, a sufficient amount of time for us to be fully vaccinated. You know, both doses um, with the 21-day period in between each dose, and then also, um, according to the CDC, we need about a several weeks of um, time after the second dose to build up immunity. And so while I definitely believe those in the building should be prioritized and those in the first groups to return should be prioritized, I'm wondering if you and FCPS will, you know, reassure teachers and commit to us that you will make sure that we have the ample amount of time to be vaccinated completely before returning to in-person learning. We're certainly, thank you caller for that question. We're certainly working very closely with ANOVA to make sure that the administering of the vaccines uh, can happen as quickly as possible. The final return to school uh, dates is something that I'm bringing back to the school board uh, in an update next week. The school board ultimately will review that also um, at a work session February 2nd. So the school board will review the final dates, but I am mindful of the vaccination schedule as I am planning return to school in person. Let's be sure too that we properly provide context here for the vaccination. The vaccination is not a silver bullet or a magic wand for schools as they return in person. Schools still rely and schools that have been open before the vaccination still rely on the successful implementation of those school mitigation strategies. The vaccination is only available, as Dr. Schwartz said right now, for adults. Um, it's only gonna be available for our staff. So it's not a silver bullet, but it is one more promising development that we hope will make our staff feel more confident as they return to school in person. So thank you very much, caller, for that question. Let's take another call. Caller, welcome to the town hall on vaccines and vaccination. Welcome. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Hi. Um, I had a medical question. Um, I had COVID one time, and then I was exposed again. 
And um, I'm not sure if I had it a second time because the nurse said not to take the test. Um, should I get the vaccine? Dr. Schwartz. So after getting COVID, natural immunity, according to the CDC, lasts for at least six months. So if you wanted to, you could defer and wait to get the vaccine later. But you also can choose to get the vaccine now. There is no harm in doing so, and it may boost your immunity. So the choice is really up to you. Um, and certainly there are no problems with getting vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. That's a great piece of information. And I have to say too, listening to your presentation today, the information about how the vaccine works, that the mRNA technology isn't a live virus. The virus isn't in you when you receive the immunization. I don't think that's something that is widely known by a lot of our community. And so this kind of information, along with the results of the uh, efficaciousness of the vaccine are just so important. And again, thank you so much for being here for questions. Let's take another call for the vaccine and vaccination town hall. Caller, welcome. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, so my question is, given that we do have the vaccination uh, possibilities in place, um, will you still be using the health matrix to determine whether it's safe to go back to school? Because, you know, I know some teachers will get the vaccination, but are you still looking at those health matrix measures? Yes, the school decision making model that we've shared with the school board and community around the three factors the number of COVID cases per 100,000, the percent positivity rate, and the school mitigation strategies. Those represent the three core CDC indicators around deciding how to open or close schools. I also wanna share with you that the governor today, along with the state superintendent, made reference to a additional uh, form of guidance that the Virginia Department of Health in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education will be providing schools so that schools can have the detailed guidance and communities can understand how we can continue to reopen if we successfully follow the school mitigation strategies. I've shared some of the work that we've done in partnership with the Fairfax County Health Department already on that model and we're looking forward to uh, looking at the state information as well. We've also spent a lot of time with our communication staff on our Stop the Spread campaign. And you can go and find out more information on our website. We're putting up posters and other ways to really make sure that we are all focused on those successful school mitigation strategies. We also, just for those of you who may not know, have shared that we have set up safety teams that are going into our schools and that will be going in as students return to school and as staff return to school to make sure those school mitigation measures are being effectively implemented in the school on a daily basis. And they will get immediate uh, feedback as those teams come in. Any corrective action that needs to be taken will be taken and we'll be sharing and reporting that information in a transparent uh, fashion as we move forward. All right, let's take an email. Uh, let's look at the email here. Um, I'm 14 weeks pregnant. Can I take the vaccine? I think that Dr. Schwartz is probably uh, for you. I think so. The, um, the vaccine trials did not include pregnant women. So we don't have any data from the trials on pregnancy. However, um, the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists both recommend that women who are pregnant consider what their risk of COVID is um, versus uh, getting the vaccine without any of that clinical trial data. So what I would suggest is you talk with your obstetrician and you make a decision about what is best for you. All right, let's take a phone call. Caller, welcome to the vaccine and vaccination town hall. Uh, hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I know I cannot get the COVID from the vaccine, uh, but um, my family and I were wondering if I get the vaccine and I'm the only one who gets it uh, in the home, am I gonna be contagious for the rest of the family? 
or or not? <laughs> that was my question. Well, thank you, caller. And you know, one of the questions really that we see our staff, Dr. Schwartz, dealing with is thinking about family, thinking about family at home. And I know, Dr. Williams, this is really one of those equity issues that we are all grappling with as we uh, face this pandemic. People in multi-generational households, people that are close together in multi-family uh, housing situations. What is the best answer to the question the caller has shared? First of all, as, as you mentioned, since the vaccine does not, cause, does not include a live virus, it cannot cause COVID-19, and therefore it would not be something that could be transmitted to others in your family. By protecting yourself from COVID disease, you're also protecting other people in your family because you're not going to be getting sick and therefore are not gonna be transmitting the, the infection to other people. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Let's take another call. Caller, welcome to the town hall. Hi, I was wondering, since reservations have not been quite perfect, I was wondering if we could have a wait list or standby system for leftover vaccines at the end of the day so we get shots and the shots don't get wasted. Well, thank you, uh, caller. I'm gonna bring in our HR Assistant Superintendent, Sean McDonald. And uh, Sean, do you wanna share any information about that that you may have? Sure, thank you, Dr. Brabrand. So we are working very closely with ANOVA on uh, the vaccination uh, scheduling. And they've assured us if there are leftover appointments and availability, they will contact us and we'll be able to send messages out uh, to our employees, encouraging them to sign up for additional slots as they become available. So we will be taking advantage of all of the available slots and vaccinations that have been made available to Fairfax County Public Schools. And I just wanna remind everyone, today was the very first day of setting up the registration process. We know there were some bumps and glitches in the road. The governor spoke about that today. But the good news is we are moving forward with 5,000 folks that are able to be registered here in this first week. That number is gonna jump to over 9,000 in the second week. And we're looking forward to vaccinating all of our FCPS staff, all that wanted, and we hope all of you will, as you learn the science, as you listen to the equity discussion. Yes, we know you have a decision to make, but we want you to be empowered with knowledge and science and data and equity context so that you can make the right decision uh, for you and for your family, but also that we can continue as a community to vaccinate Virginia together, to vaccinate Fairfax County Public Schools together, and to work to return our students to in-person learning so that students and families can begin the slow but steady measured approach back to normalcy in our lives. It's not gonna happen in a day or a week or a month. COVID will continue to be with us even as we do the vaccination. But this is the true beginning of the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's take a few more questions. Uh, let's see, we have a phone call. Caller, welcome to the Vaccine and Vaccination Town Hall. Hi, um, my question is, um, I'm also pregnant and due in about six weeks. So since I can't sign up for an allotted time now, when I am ready to get the vaccine, will an FCPS employee still go through the same procedure in signing up to get the vaccine, even if it's happening, let's say, in March or the beginning of April? Uh, thank you for that question. Let's see, Mr. McDonald, do we, do we have a, uh, an answer for that question? Sure, so right now, uh, the available vaccine is being offered during the time window or time frame that was outlined in the memorandum that went out to employees yesterday. Uh, ultimately, uh, the hope is that as we progress through the coming weeks, uh, that more vaccinations will be available. Uh, and ultimately, uh, employees who aren't able to take advantage of this current offering would be able to do so through their physicians and their providers. Uh, the, the vaccine would not or would be available to you through the health plan uh, and through your provider uh, and covered uh, under that plan. Thanks, Mr. McDonald. I see one of our questions now. One of the questions here on our email is, can FCPS let me take the day off after the second dose? I've heard it's difficult. Well, first, let me just share briefly, 
on the day uh, that you are um, to have the dosage, uh, regardless of whether we are virtual or in person, again, right now we're all paused and in a virtual status, teachers will have the opportunity to provide asynchronous instruction on that day. We have shared that with school principals, and so teachers, we want you to know you will have the opportunity to have asynchronous instruction that day so that you can go and get your appointment done. Obviously, if you have any complications uh, with the vaccination, I believe, Mr. McDonald, and employees would be able to use that as they would normally for sick leave. Is that correct? Uh, so sick leave is available, and, and so you would just uh, put in your absence or contact your supervisor to let them know that you would be out for that day. And for folks that are some of our non-teaching staff or operational staff, we will work, program managers will work with you to have a flexible leave policy so that you can get both the first and the second dose, even if that second dose, as we said, is gonna be scheduled by ANOVA. If that conflicts with your work schedule, we'll work with you so that you can have the time and place to go back uh, and get that second uh, dose. So please know we're committed to doing everything we can to support you in being vaccinated for both of the doses. Let's take another email. Uh, how will parents know if I have been vaccinated or not? This is one of those things that we have a federal law and actually, you know, it's kind of an equity issue here, Dr. Williams, I'd like to start with you. You know, people uh, want to know who's been vaccinated, who is not. Can you talk a little bit about uh, HIPAA? Uh, I know you're not an HR expert, but I want to start with you from that equity lens, and then we'll let Mr. McDonald add a few comments. Well, I think it's an important question. Um, and certainly in doing this process, we need to be observant of people's rights. Um, and we don't want to solve one problem and violate or create another, right? And so one of the things that I would say is really important, and it goes back to a point that Dr. Schwartz made, the best course of action is to get vaccinated. If we all buy in, if we all get vaccinated, then we have the comfort in the community. But certainly disclosures of that sort would not be ones that we would make. And so again, that's why we're having forums around like this to kind of talk about the importance. If you're in a multi-generational home, you make it safer for your family if you're vaccinated. Um, principals, teachers, we all have a responsibility to make our society safer. So my response would be, let's all do our homework, make good decisions, and live safely together. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. I really appreciate that. such powerful context. And Mr. McDonald, as a HR uh, assistant superintendent, there is also federal law around the disclosure of certain medical information uh, to the public. Absolutely, and so uh, that, that federal law would prevent Fairfax County Public Schools from disclosing uh, your medical, private medical information. Uh, so FCPS would not be sharing uh, whether or not you had been vaccinated uh, with the students or, or their families. One thing that I think is important as we continue to have this discussion is table setting about the weeks and months ahead. As I shared earlier this week, we will be returning to school in person this academic year during the second semester. But we must also be equally clear, COVID will still be with us in our community. We know our students will still not have availability uh, and access to the vaccination, as Dr. Schwartz said, that work is ongoing. We know not everybody in our community that will interface with our school, nor necessarily all of our staff will have had the vaccination. That's why it has been, is, and will continue to be important to follow the school mitigation strategies that are so important to making sure we're putting safety front and center as we do return to school. Let's take another call. Caller, welcome to the town hall on vaccines and vaccination. Um, hello, yes, um, I do have a question. Um, I understand that um, after I get the um, vaccine, um, there's no live virus that's going to be injected to my muscle. But I'm wondering, after I'm fully vaccinated, am I still going to be a carrier if I'm exposed to the uh, virus? Is this, you know, so that, you know, I, I want to know if it's safe for my family to be around me after I'm vaccinated, are they still going to have a risk of getting the virus? Thank you, caller. Dr. Schwartz, this is one of the questions we hear a lot about. Um, share with us your insights. 
So what we do know is that the vaccine will prevent symptomatic disease. What we don't know is whether it also prevents asymptomatic infection. In other words, you may not have any illness but still be infected with the virus. And that's something that the companies and public health are currently studying. Because of this, it is still recommended that people who have been vaccinated use the same mitigation measures as everybody else, that they wear face coverings, that they socially distance, wash their hands, stay away from others when sick, et cetera. Um, so that's equally important after vaccination as before. Dr. Schwartz, this is a question because it has been asked. How will science, how will medicine begin to understand whether um, there will be asymptomatic transmission, if you will, even though you want to get COVID uh, or COVID symptoms after getting the vaccine? Is there a way, how is science going to be able to begin to track or look at that kind of data? So one way that we can tell whether somebody has been infected asymptomatically is by doing a viral test or by doing an antibody test that would indicate by the presence of antibodies whether they had been infected or not. Um, the vaccine induces antibodies, so that second method you know, may not be um, as effective in terms of looking, in terms of studying whether um, people can be asymptomatically infected even after vaccination. So it's likely that this would be done um, by using those viral tests and by assessing um, the rates of infection among people who have been vaccinated and comparing it with those who have not been vaccinated. Mm. And are any studies, are you aware of, are there studies already being done to start to look at that question or is that something that's still um, out on the horizon to look at as we move forward? No, th those studies are ongoing. Oh, good. Um, so we think we will have a medical answer to that very question. It's just some time away uh, as we're just starting the vaccination process. That's right. And I would point out that the other vaccines that are out there do affect asymptomatic carriage of the pathogen. Um, and so we, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if this vaccination also um, reduced the um, asymptomatic infection. So we believe in a way then, it's very possible based on the prior history of other vaccines that this actually will offer that protection. But again, following the data and science, we don't have the data yet to make that claim. We're gonna run those tests and, and then later on we'll be able to share with our community that indeed um, it could prevent asept asymptomatic uh, transmission. Exactly. Okay, uh, let's take a call. Caller, welcome to the town hall. Hi, thank you, Dr. Braybrand. Um, I have two questions, but I understand if I can only get to one. Okay. Uh, my first question is, what is being done to ensure that staff who are in lower priority groups are not receiving the vaccine before higher priority staff members? Well, let me take your first question. We are doing our very best, as we shared in our uh, messaging to you, um, given that we've never done anything like this before, um, working with ANOVA, um, that we're asking for people to step up and employ the honor system. We've shared the prioritization. We've shared which week you should be registering for. And we're asking people, honestly, to do the right thing. We've always been a school system that's been aligned around core values of serving our students and families and community. And Dr. Williams mentioned about that service to the community so eloquently just a few minutes ago. The right thing is to honor the prioritization that we've shared. And we hope that our staff listening tonight and those that are not, but you all are here tonight to go back to staff and say that this is the best way to handle it. If we had a more sophisticated process, we would have already shared it with you. This is the best that we can do in the situation that we have. And we have plenty of vaccine. As I shared with you before, we have talked with ANOVA. They asked for your patience. ANOVA has been working hard at vaccinating thousands of people a day. And we're confident over the next just few weeks, everybody who wants to be vaccinated in Fairfax County Public Schools as an employee will be vaccinated. We're committed to doing that. And you had a second question, caller. And what's that question? 
I did. Thank you so much. Um, my other question was, are there plans for ANOVA and FCPS to coordinate administering the vaccines at school sites? Yeah, that's a great question. I think right now, um, ANOVA, I, I think right now ANOVA is using the old Exxon Mobil building as its central site just because of the sheer logistics uh, of the uh, issue. Um, it is something that we'll go back and share with ANOVA and uh, see if there's other opportunities to do that. I don't know if the health department, if you have any insight into that I, uh, or not. Um, I, I don't at this time. Okay. I do know that ANOVA in some smaller areas has gone to using school buildings, uh, but I think right now, given the volume, 25,000 employees, uh, and that doesn't uh, separate out that ANOVA is also working to vaccinate private school staff, uh, as well as all of the employees and staff in the City of Falls Church School System. So they truly do have a lot on their plate. They worked hard today. They're currently continuing to work hard to address some of the website challenges, and we're gonna continue to work with them uh, in the days ahead. Let's take another phone call. Caller, welcome to the town hall. Hi, hi, Dr. Ray Brent. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I know this was uh, addressed um, in, in what you were talking about earlier and just now. I, I think my question here is, um, I know that FCPS and INOVA are working very closely with all the different counties. Is there a guarantee that uh, other entities won't take up the, uh, not, not necessarily the vaccination uh, quantity, but the staffing and slots for appointments even in the next month that would conflict with FCPS's plans because of the, tra the uh, high traffic that the website is going through. Right, so let me, let me and, and Mr. McDonald, please add in if I get this incorrect. You've been given, we have been given a specific link that ANOVA is working with, a separate registration process that will not cause that kind of issue that you described. We just need folks to understand that we had so many of our folks excited today uh, about registering. You know, today the Virginia Commonwealth University released a new poll. 70% of Virginians, and Dr. Schwartz, I don't know if you've heard this yet, I just saw it off the wire before I came here. 70% of Virginians say they will get the vaccination, which is far above some of the national numbers that we're hearing. In Northern Virginia, in Northern Virginia, we are hearing in this VCU poll, database poll that 90% of folks in Northern Virginia wish to get the vaccination. That to me, I have not heard numbers that high, but I think it speaks to our community and their role in uh, helping us get through this pandemic. So I'm very hopeful and excited about this news, um, but this is a separate registration link. And uh, Mr. McDonald, anything else to add to that in terms of answering the caller? No, uh, it, absolutely. We have our own uh, gateway through and that, that special link for Fairfax County Public Schools, and we've been allocated a set number of vaccinations each week. Uh, so please go onto that, that site, um, exercise patience as the, the site is, is being uh, worked on, uh, and get registered to, to take the vaccine if you so wish. Thank you. Let's take uh, another phone call. Caller, welcome to the town hall. Hi, good evening. Um, I suppose this question is more directed to Dr. Schultz. My question is, has an mRNA vaccine been used before or has one ever been approved? Um, in the United States, there are no other approved mRNA vaccines, but they have been developed for a number of emerging health threats. So if you remember uh, Zika virus from a couple years ago, an mRNA vaccine was developed for Zika virus, but because that infection um, went, um, basically went away, the numbers decreased, um, it never was licensed or used in the U.S. population. Thank you, uh, Dr. Schwartz. I tell you what, it's so fascinating to be able to hear information that we simply don't get out enough. And I think, you know, Dr. Williams, before I take another question on the email, what can we do with an equity lens? I know one of our challenges right now in FCPS that uh, you're being asked and I'm asking for your help is how do we better communicate? Yeah. 
um, what tools are we using and what tools are we not using to make sure our message is getting out to all of the diverse groups that make up our FCPS staff and our FCPS community and what can we do better and how can we do it better? Sure, that's a great question because sitting here with Dr. Schwartz, I feel like taking notes, right? Um, and information is power, um, but how different communities get information is what we have to think about. So are we in churches? Are we in community groups? Are we working with people who have influence in communities to relay the message? So we have to think outside of just the mainstream and think about ways that we get proximate to groups that are estranged from conversations like the ones we're having tonight. Well, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with you on that because I think it's so important. And I know one of the areas that you have responsibility over is working with our parent liaisons and our family outreach centers. And how can we do that even better now, mm -hmm. even if we need to make personal reach out calls to our staff to encourage them uh, to do the vaccination. And, sure. and I look forward to hearing your ideas. Let's take an email. Are substitutes allowed to get vaccinated? Mr. McDonald, this is a question we're hearing a lot. We're also hearing about monitors. We've been busy hiring monitors to prepare for uh, return to school in person learning if the teacher has an ADA accommodation and is remaining virtual. So will substitutes and monitors be allowed to be vaccinated? Yes, absolutely. Our substitutes and our, our monitors uh, may uh, partake in this, this process to be vaccinated. Our monitors should align themselves with the uh, student groupings that are found in the schedule. So if you uh, have been hired to support students in groups one through four, you should be working towards uh, signing up for an appointment during weeks one or two. Uh, and each of the subsequent groups are outlined in that, that memo. Also for substitutes, we've allotted a time frame for them in group, or I'm sorry, week three. Um, so all substitutes will have an opportunity uh, to get vaccinated. If I may just take a moment to talk a little bit about the, the registration process. So uh, once you've gone to that, that special link that was provided in that email, that message that went out, uh, you will fill out that, that uh, questionnaire through ANOVA there are a number of steps that you need to take uh, to prepare yourself for your appointment. Uh, one thing you'll need to do is make sure that when you go for your appointment that you have either your FCPS ID badge or you have a pay stub with you to identify as an FCPS employee. For individuals that aren't certain on where you can find your most recent pay stub, you can either locate it in the pay guidance that's emailed to you before each pay cycle or paycheck or you can go to the Uconnect site, uh, the employee portal, and print off a copy of your pay guidance. In addition to that form of identification, you'll need a, a government ID, such as a driver's license, as well as either an electronic or a printed copy of your registration for your appointment, and then finally, a copy of the consent form. So please make sure you have all those items when you arrive for your appointment so that uh, the process goes smoothly when you uh, are there working with ANOVA. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Really appreciate that. Let's take another phone call. Caller, welcome to the vaccine and vaccination town hall. Hi, I had a question. Uh, if I get the vaccination and um, will there still be a chance that I pick up the virus and I bring it home to my own children and they could be sick with the multi-system inflammatory? Dr. Schwartz? So the vaccine will protect you against getting symptomatic disease. We don't know if people who are vaccinated can still get asymptomatic infection, and there would be a possibility that you could transmit it to someone else in your household. However, again, through the prevention of symptomatic infection, you're going to be decreasing the risk of people in your household and other people who you come in contact with. I see we have another question here from our email uh, folks. One of them is, will I be able to get a shot at CVS instead? Actually, Dr. Schwartz, I want to ask you about this one. Our focus for tonight and for the next three weeks is for our FCPS staff to know that we are working in partnership with ANOVA to get you vaccinated as part of the government's prioritized access to 1B, essential workers that include educators. But I do know, Dr. Schwartz, that the government um, is working on 
sharing the vaccination through large pharmacies. We've heard this, CVS, Walgreens. Do you have any information from the health department perspective about how that work is going and what that will look like? So the Virginia Department of Health is working with CVS to plan uh, vaccination through CVS pharmacies. Um, it's not available yet at this time. So when more vaccine becomes available, it's likely that vaccination is going to be possible at a number of different locations, at CVS pharmacies, potentially at other pharmacies in our county, as well as at private medical care providers. But right now, given the limited supply of vaccine that's available, um, that window is not open yet. I'm sure I just wanna ask, <laughs> this is the question I wanna ask Dr. Schwartz, because I know many may be asking, do we know, and this has been, I've been asked questions where having the crystal ball, do we have any idea when we think there will be a more um, extensive rollout to these pharmacies where people can just go to their nearby pharmacy that they already go to pick up medicine and get a shot, or is it just too early to tell? It's really too early to tell at this time. Um, the demand for vaccine uh, at this point with the groups that have been prioritized so far uh, far exceeds what is available for supply. So I want to kind of pick up on what you had said already, which is that people need to be patient. And um, for the groups that we're already vaccinating, for example, people who are 75 years old and greater, um, it's going to take us some time to work through this population mm -hmm. in Fairfax County, um, but there will be vaccination for everybody. It just won't be immediate. And you know, one of the things I think that's important to remember is we're being given this opportunity as an FCPS staff and community to be prioritized as essential workers, as essential to our country and our community. And that is really a, a privilege and a responsibility I think we all have to reflect on as we look at this vaccine and this vaccine uh, process. I do wanna spend a minute if we could for our audience at home of our FCPS employees to see our FCPS COVID-19 vaccine schedule. As you can see for week one, we're focused on bus drivers and bus attendants, custodial staff, food and nutrition staff, school-based clerical staff, and groups one through four, the administrators, teachers, classroom instructional support folks, and hourly, hourly staff who have supported groups one through four who've already been in our school um, and have not yet returned after winter break. We also have, as you know, athletics going on and our winter and fall sports coaches who are already currently in uh, working with our kids will also be included, including the DSAs and trainers that work with those coaches. Week two, our groups five and six staff. That includes administrators, teachers, classroom, and hourly employees for those groups in uh, five through six. That includes things like pre-K, kindergarten, our special education kids and grades one and two, I believe, maybe even a, a few more grades in elementary, but you can go and click on that group for additional group description. And then I wanna just go back a slide if we could, that staff from week one who are unable to schedule, and again, today was just the first day, but if you have, um, uh, you get in and you're not able to find a schedule time in that first week, you may find a time in the second week and we will be doubling, uh, NOVA has shared they'll be d uh, 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 doubling the amount of uh, vaccination appointments available in the second week. So we really are just beginning to ramp up. Let's go to week three, if we could show week three. Uh, that's that last week in January into early February. That's group seven and eight, which includes our middle and high school administrators, teachers, classroom and hourly employees. It includes substitutes, central office staff that weren't in those first uh, two weeks, school board members and staff, spring sport coaches, and any school staff not connected to a specific student group. And again, in this week three, uh, staffs from weeks two and three uh, really are, are uh, unable to schedule a vaccination can get a makeup. And then week four, any of the groups from any of the first three weeks who are unable to schedule a vaccine or they need a makeup appointment, or they were simply out of town, um, will be able to access getting the vaccination. Folks, I wanna thank all of you tonight. I wanna thank you, Dr. Schwartz, for an amazing presentation. We'd really love, and we'll put that up on our website with your permission, mm -hmm. 
to really share that information out, share it on social media. Dr. Williams, thank you for bringing your voice and the equity lens into this discussion today. And Mr. McDonald, thank you for all the work you're doing on behalf of all of our employees. We are so grateful that you have worked together with Dr. Boyd and others, Mr. Smith and our other members of our leadership team to provide this, this real benefit, this opportunity to be vaccinated and be part of a movement in our country and our commonwealth to really begin to see the light at the end of the tunnel of this pandemic. This is a new year and hope and help is on the way. Thank you all for being here tonight. Please review the information, ask additional questions if you need it. We're here to help and together we can vaccinate Virginia. Together we can vaccinate Fairfax County Public Schools and we will talk to you soon. Have a wonderful evening and a great weekend.